Hello, everyone. Welcome. We're going to give all of our community just a, a moment to log in. We can see a number of people coming through on the, the wait list, but Stephanie and Anna and Stuart, Charity, hi, June, hi, David, Heather, we see you, everyone, Kennedy, Denise, Christopher, love it. Yeah. Dr. Spence, we've got a, a great audience today. Yeah, I'm excited. <laughs> I, and I see um, my friend Anna Chafin. Um, and so really excited to see her and know that we're going to be making some new friends as well. Yeah. That looks great, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, as everyone's coming on and we welcome our, our City Club community, want to invite you to get in the chat. So say hello, tell us your name, what club you're from. And, and, and say hi to each other. Um, but for the sake of how many people we are gonna have on the call today, we're gonna leave everyone on mute. Um, but please say hello and, and tell us what's going on in your city. So far on this screen, I can see Texas, Florida, Atlanta, Los Angeles, Seattle, San Diego, Orange County. So give us a shout out where else you might be, be calling in for, um, for today's conversation. Wow. And Brittany, just let us know. It looks like that we still have people joining us. We'll give everyone just a second. Philadelphia. Oh, Virginia, more folk. Wow. Tower Florida, <laughs> Tower Tysons, <laughs> Commerce Atlanta. Love it. Fantastic. This is really exciting. Looking at, you know, the representation. This is quite exciting. Mm hmm Dr. Spence and I were just chatting about the, the silver lining in, in having these virtual conversations of having so many cities actually engage together um, virtually. So we're, we're really grateful for making the most of that. And I think, Brittany, you go ahead and let me know if we have some additional people in the, the waiting room. Got some we have a few more coming in, but I think we have just about everyone in right now. And I'll just keep letting them in as they come. Okay, fantastic. Well, in respect of your time, we want to go ahead and get started. And first and foremost, just thank you for showing up, for, for being here today, um, for engaging in this conversation um, that we think is so timely and that we are so grateful to have. So as we get started, um, want to, to let you know a couple housekeeping details. So as mentioned, if you're just coming in, we will keep everyone on mute um, for the beginning of our conversation, um, but we will have chance to go into breakout rooms where we can hear from each other and, and come back. So you will have a, a chance to do that. And just want everyone to take a deep breath. And all of the distractions that we all have You've taken the time, you've made the time to show up and, and just having a posture of presence. And something that's really rare for a lot of us in our professional lives is to take the posture of a student. And so I'm really excited to be a student of Dr. Spence today and um, for all of us to, to learn something new with, with open ears. Um, and particularly for our City Club community, we say that we, we believe in community and thank you so much for showing up today to see how we can make our community better and, and what that really means. So um, with, with that, I do wanna say again, in respect of your time, we will try to keep this at, at the hour mark. Um, so if you do have additional commitments right at that hour mark, we will allow you to politely move on or to stay with us for the conversation. So just wanna say that ahead of time. And then um, without further ado, I am honored to introduce this group to Dr. Spence and to say thank you to Anna Chafin um, and, and the screen as well for the power of relationships. So um, Dr. Spence was actually on the calendar to speak at our Buckhead Club um, before COVID, before uh, so many changes yeah. in our world. and. Now we're privileged to, to, again, open up the conversation to so many across different cities. So thank you for that relationship and the introduction. And Dr. Spence, we're, we're just, as I mentioned, excited to be your student for today. Um, 
Dr. Spence is the director at Spelman College for Social Justice and the program um, coordinator of the Truth and Racial Healing and Transformation Center at, at Spelman. So um, she's going to be taking us through some, some content and as well as letting us know the series for the next two conversations as well. So without further ado, Dr. Spence, the, the floor is yours and thank you. Well, thank you and, and welcome to all of you. I, I'm just really excited because, you know, as we talk about this particular moment in time, this screen looks like where we should be going, right? Where people are coming together, representing varied backgrounds, varied regions of the country to just come together and to engage in conversations because it's through conversations that we get to know each other and to appreciate um, each other. And so I, um, before I even begin, I want to thank Casey Faulkner and Brittany Flowers for the work that they're doing because we know a lot of work goes on behind the scenes and oftentimes we don't necessarily pay the due credit that we should. So I want to um, thank both of them um, for the technical assistance, but also for the energy that they brought to me. And most especially, I want to um, thank someone who is a colleague, but now has really become one of my girlfriends, and that's Anna Chafin from the Atlanta Commerce Club. Um, she is um, like my partner in progress, and we are um, just looking forward to continuing to work together and to learn from each other, because that's what we're going to do today. And so I hope that as, um, as Casey indicated, that everyone has kind of cleared their head, cleared their head space just for about about 60 minutes so that we can engage in a conversation. Um, sometimes these conversations are difficult because we're dealing with issues that perhaps we haven't talked about or we haven't talked about in mixed company. And so I'm going to um, share my screen with you in just a second and, that's, and we'll follow the screen. You also will have an opportunity to um, participate and in small breakout groups, but also I'll ask just a few questions at the beginning, just for a few responses, because again, we do hope to maximize our time with you, but also to encourage you to participate in, this is going to be a three-part series. So it's a, there are three courses in this series. And so we will, hopefully that you all will be able to join us if, you know, the evaluation, you'll evaluate and determine if you want to do that or not. But let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, can everyone see the screen? You are, okay, I see heads nodding. All righty. And so today, of course, as, as you know, this is a part of a conversation series and the theme that Casey has come up with is community understanding, transformation, and healing. And it's so appropriate as we engage in today's session is going to be primarily about community, developing community understandings. And then we'll talk more about how do we begin to transform as individuals as well as um, communities. And then we will, in fact, seek healing. I always start any presentation by looking at the organization, organizations that I'm responding to. And um, I looked at the Club Core purpose statement and it says, you know, one of the main things it says at the very top is building relationships and enriching lives. And so certainly this conversation series is a part of that and affirms that commitment. I won't read the entire statement, but it says something about when it talks about the purpose of building the relationships and enriching the lives of its members. It says as the largest owner and operator of private clubs, Club Corps brings its members a higher and more consistent level of service and an unwavering commitment to make the club the members home away from home. And as we think about notions of home, it is important for us to really think about, you know, what does it feel like to actually be home? You know, home is a place of comfort, it's a place of refuge, we, um, our own private homes are in fact, provide those functions for us, but also our communities should provide those functions for us as well. We are members of, you know, of local communities, national communities, as well as world communities. And those communities should in, in fact facilitate a feeling of home for all. 
And so the discussion series today is generating conversations and knowledge building. The next one will be engaging an anti-racist framework. And then the third one will be a racial healing circle. And so I do hope that you all will be able to join me on all, for all three. But I wanna start off with a quote that I think is just really important. And I, I believe that it is also quite appropriate as we kind of examine where we are in the world today. And this is a quote that came from Bangari Mata. She won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2004. She was the first African woman to ever receive a Nobel Peace Prize. And she won it. She won this Nobel Peace Prize for her work around environmental sustainability. And so she is one of the founders of the Green Belt Movement. Um, she's born, um, she's Kenyan. And the Green Belt Movement, again, although it was talking about environmental sustainability and ecological sustainability, she really likened it to when we look at our world communities, we really want to talk about environmental sustainability. What kind of people do we need to grow in order to sustain our communities? So her quote is, in the course of history, there comes a time when humanity is called to shift to a new level of consciousness, to reach a higher moral ground, a time when we have to shed our fear and give hope to each other. That time is now. Now, she said this in 2004, but I would suggest that in 2020, this quote is quite appropriate. Again, in the course of history, there comes a time when humanity is called to shift to a new level of consciousness, to reach a higher moral ground, a time when we have to shed our fear and give hope to each other. That time is now. You all, each of you has made a decision that you want to be a part of communities that are engaging in shifting to a new level of consciousness and shedding fear and also building communities, communities that have as its foundation hope, hope for humanity, all of humanity. And so I brought this one, this quote to you because I believe that it is so important. And again, I hope you all aren't seeing this little buzzer on my screen. I'm gonna keep trying to work with it. So the first thing that I wanted to do, as a sociologist, we also deal with visual imageries that tell stories. As a sociologist, one of the things that I talk to my students about all of the time is that when you observe phenomena, you have to place it in a particular socio-historical context, meaning that nothing is flat. Everything that we observe visually, every interaction that we have, every um, action, rules, laws, policies have a socio-historical context, meaning that we have to ask the question, what was happening in, what's happening in society? What are the social forces that are bringing forth whatever it is that I'm observing? And what's the history associated with this moment? because I can't be a good sociologist, I can't be a good observer if I can't place things in context. And so I'm gonna share just a couple of images for you and I want you to think about them. And then I just like just a, maybe maybe two or three people just to comment on the socio-historical context for these images. Again, socially, what's happening socially? What's going on? Who are the people? What are they doing? What are they talking about? Why are they there? Why are they assembled? But also what's the history that helps us understand these images? Again, here we are with some other images. And images are very important because images tell stories. And so your visual artists will in fact engage in, you know, in hour long or more than hour long um, lectures about the importance of images and how images can also in, in fact reflect a particular society. And so as we look at these images and we look back at the other two, could I just get maybe two or three people to comment on 
what you would say if so 10 years from now 10 years from now you're going to have to explain this i mean hopefully these images will show up in somebody's history books right and you you may have a child or a grandchild or a niece or a nephew who will ask you do you were you around during that time you know they think we're all ancient right um, and so sometimes they ask us questions and I'm like, you know, well, that was way before I was born. I don't know, but I can give you some context. But you will be called upon to talk about these images. So could I just get a few volunteers and Brittany will, well, I think Brittany, they can actually um, unmute themselves. Can a few? Um, I think if we have them. Um, raise their hand. Yes. Okay. Yes. And then we'll, let me see. We just maybe have two or three. Anyone? <laughs> no talkers yet? Or, or is Stuart Jackson, you look like you want to say something, but you have to unmute yourself. And Stephanie Ball, you're going to have to unmute yourself. Okay. okay. Let me unmute them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see here. Let me get Stephanie. All right. Stephanie can unmute herself. And Stuart. And I'm sorry if I don't see others. I'm just looking at what's coming up on my screen. Okay, Stephanie. Hi, how is Hi. everyone? It's so nice to be here. Um, and thank you for your beautiful opening and especially this, that quote is spectacular. I love that. I've never heard that before and it's so poignant. Yeah. Um, I think context is so important and I've actually been able to get in some really excellent conversations with people already that are still going to be relevant 10 years from now when we start talking about these pictures again and particularly around why do we have to say black lives matter what's the, so problematic about all lives matter what's the difference between the protests and the riots and the looting and all of that kinds of things and um i have an advantage my sister is the Chair of Black Studies at Occidental. Okay. <laughs> so anytime I need a source or a book, I can just text my sister and be like, okay, I need a little backup here. Um, but what has been really effective for me in bringing some context into why we're still where we are is to meet people where they are, are already at a little bit and bring up Martin Luther King. But instead of the parts of Martin Luther King that everybody already knows about, bringing in some of his other speeches like The Other America and his letter from Birmingham and saying, okay, you have to look at all of the things that he said and see how many of the things that he was speaking to are still big problems in society today to understand why everyone is still so upset. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then Stuart, I think you wanted to share something. Oh, I was just kind of uh, laughing because no one was actually speaking, but um, I'll still make a comment anyway. Uh, I appreciate you. <laughs> no, you know, I'm here. Yeah, I, I'm here in Atlanta. So we are um, dealing with so many issues that's across the nation as well. But in the first photo, um, you know, with the hand raised in the photo, you, you would be explaining to people 10 years from now about Black Lives Matter and uh, the fist, but also that it goes back to the late 60s and uh, the struggles that happened 50 years ago that are still happening in 2020. Yeah. Um, and probably 10 years from now when we're explaining this to nieces and nephews and other people, but also about the part of justice for George Floyd and I Can't Breathe uh, but people wearing masks, I was going to say yeah. that perhaps even in 10 years from now, they might think that they're wearing masks because it's I can't breathe. Right. We also right. got to remind people that amongst yeah. all this, 2020 was a very strange year and yeah. we had COVID. And so we were, everybody was being affected by a virus that was teaching everyone that all of us are vulnerable. Yeah. And, um, not to say all lives matter, but black lives matter, but there was just so much tension and scare. Everyone was scared. Yeah. You know, everyone is yeah. scared. And, yeah. um, and I also agree that the opening statement that you posted and this whole conversation that we're going to have today and over the next uh, three sessions is something I'm really looking forward to. Great. Thank you. And so sorry for putting you on the spot, Stuart, but I just saw, I just got some energy from you. So I just want to <laughs> 
Well, Anna Chafin knows me, so <laughs> she knows I'll speak up if he's asked me to. And thank you, Stephanie, as well. I think Jesse wants to make a comment. Okay, and then we'll move on. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you. I was trying to figure out how to work Zoom. I know Ricky <laughs> pick on me. It's only been a few months, right? Thank you for these imageries. Uh, I always share as a you know black male from my perspective is uh, so I mean I don't represent all black men, but I would say it's liberating, right? It's uh, it's it's inspiration. It's um, being seen. And to an earlier comment regarding to uh, the sixties, you write my parents. Where that, that's their journey, that's so they lived it, and they share with me often. And we benefit from their struggle yeah. and what they, their protests and what they've done. And we're seeing the outcome of that work. So yeah. the work we do today, being present to, to today and leaning in with a high level of consciousness, is really going to shift the narrative for yeah. all. And so I'm looking forward to, and to your point, it won't be a quick win. We don't expect yeah. to see it today. But the results of what we're doing today is going to be beautiful for tomorrow. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you so much. And thank each of you for um, participating. And, and, and as we move forward, I did want to say one thing about the June, Juneteenth, because it's clear that Juneteenth was in fact, is in fact a recognition, a day of recognition for the African-American community. But many individuals just had not heard of it before. They literally had not heard of it. And so as edu and there's no reason to be upset because someone hasn't heard of it before. You know, that's you know, that's a part of our own history, you know, lessons that we all received and you know, whatever we went to school or you know, our educational structure. I don't know that it was taught at my Catholic school here in Atlanta. Um, but again, I just wanted to say something about it just to make certain that individuals who have not heard of it understand the significance of it. So Juneteenth, again, the date is June 19th, 1865. What we know is that this little document here, the Emancipation Proclamation, was actually first drafted in 1862, but was finalized in 1863. However, individuals who were enslaved did not know across the country and no one attempted to let them know that the Emancipation Proclamation had in fact been adopted as federal policy in 1865. And so for, I'm sorry, in 1863. So for two additional years, individuals were enslaved. And so, and when we connect that to the wonderful work that appeared in the New York Times, probably about a year and a half ago, it was called the 1619 Project. 1619 marks the year when there is a record of the first enslaved Africans coming to the US. So again, if you, if you subtract 1619, from 1865, that's over 244 years, you know, or more. And so this is the, you know, this is the reason why this particular date is in fact um, acknowledged because even though emancipation occurred two years earlier, the individuals who were enslaved did not know. They were not notified. And there are a lot of reasons why we keep good workers, right? You know, all of us represent corporations and we don't want our workers to leave. But um, this was in fact, what historians say was a very intentional act that um, individuals who were slave owners did not want to release their unpaid labor. And so again, that's the significance of Juneteenth. And I know that there's a great national movement to actually attempt to, um, to make it a national recognition day. So that's the, that's the short, quick and dirty history of it. So um, there's also been some really interesting press coverage. And so again, as a sociologist and as you all, as you will be chronicling this particular experience, and for years from now, you'll look and see what were, you know, what was the newspaper saying? So we've got newspaper articles, Confederate statutes are coming down following George Floyd's death. Here's what we know. That was on CNN, June 21st. 
corporate America speaking up on systemic racism is only the first step. Now let's act. And so there was a, com a comment in, embedded in that article, which appeared in Forbes.com. It said, it's good that corporate America has started to add its voice to the George Floyd protests. Business can and must play a leading role in addressing racial equity. So this was a statement that was in fact included in Forbes, Forbes.com. Another one from the Was Washington Post, from wake wor word to woke word. Siri and Alexa tell you Black Lives Matter, but tech still has a diversity problem. Tech companies are expressing support for the protest movement, but many still lack diversity. And I know that you all represent various entities, but as we engage in these conversations and we talk about action steps, we need to examine our own homes, right? To see how committed we are to diversity and where does it show up? within our various places as we move forward. So why do we need to create a space for narrative engagement and shifting of consciousness? Again, as Bangari Mata talks about, why are cross-racial and intergenerational discussions important? First of all, because prejudice, which leads to racism, is often fed by ignorance. We are all ignorant about something. I know we don't like to be called ignorant, but you know, I'm really ignorant when it comes to you know trying to navigate some of these online portals or you know Twitter and Instagram and TikTok. I'm ignorant. I am totally ignorant. But there's a lot of stuff I'm probably I'm ignorant about. So we can admit our ignorance, right? And prejudice, if you look at the word, is prejudge is based in there. And it's a prejudgment based on ignorance. It's based on something you don't even really know. And so there's not been an opportunity to actually in, to be informed. Also, empathetic understanding is important to build anti-racist practices. We have to understand each other. We have to be able to place ourselves within the shoes of others to gain a better understanding so that we can act in a way that is not that is not racist. And when I say that, I'm saying that we all, all of us can engage and learn to, to exhibit anti-racist practices. Experiences of racism have varied over time and cultural context. So Stuart talked about the 60s. And certainly I talked about the Emancipation Proclamation and Juneteenth. And Stephanie brought us up, you know, to today, the conversations that are occurring. Jesse talked about his experiences. We know that experiences have varied over time and varied cultural context. Responses to racism have also varied by time. So many people say, oh, well, we've come a long way. Well, of course we've come a long way. But the reality is it still exists. It is in fact one of these kind of impenetrable, very forceful cores of our, even our national identity. And so it's one of those things, yes, we've moved, we've made some progress, but again, it's clear that enough progress has not been made. And it's clear that as the club core is interested in engaging in these conversations so that we can be a part of the solution, you know, and not the problem. Um, we also live very separate and segregated lives. And so separate and segregated lived experiences have an immunizing effect. If there's no one in your community who's being abused or battered because of race, then you don't really know that much about it. Or if your circle of friends don't necessarily talk about these issues, then it's an immunizing effect. It doesn't affect me. Lack of difficult discussions perpetuates distance and denial. We don't really like to talk about these issues. We, I mean, it's just, you know, it's not comfortable. But again, until we actually talk about it, we won't be able to make progress. And sometimes when we don't talk about it, we just deny the existence. Difficult dialogues have proven to promote social change and interracial discussions promote racial healing. And so we hope that you know throughout this process, we'll get to that point. And so I'm going to assign you all to some breakout groups and you're gonna be able to talk to each other um, when you go into the breakout group, so there's some important kind of touchstones or just kind of guides that I want you to follow. First of all, I want you to listen deeply. 
Listen is important. We must listen. I want you to identify assumptions that even you are making as you listen to someone or perhaps to someone that are embedded in what someone's saying, but we're not going to judge, right? So we're gonna to move to the next one. We're gonna suspend judgment. I want you to speak your truth because it's truth that brings us to real healing. Speak your truth. Now, this is a very diverse group. And so make, most of you probably don't know each other and don't know affiliations. But again, let's try to maintain confidentiality. Let's have kind of a sacredness to our classroom. So we try our best to maintain converse, um, confidentiality. And then the last one, which I absolutely love, and I'm trying my best to try my best to use this with my family and everybody else. And that is when things get difficult, meaning that if you don't quite understand where someone's coming from, or someone is really kind of grating your nerve, when things get difficult, turn to wonder. I wonder why she's saying that, or I wonder why he feels that way, or I wonder why. Rather than judging, let's just kind of take a step back and try to empathize. I wonder what it is about their experience that makes them say these things or do these things. And that's a difficult one, but I'm practicing it as well. And so again, um, Please remember these, listen deeply, identify assumptions, suspend judgment, speak your truth, maintain confidentiality, and when things get difficult, turn to wonder, okay? And so these are the two discussion prompts, and we, we will um, broadcast these in your breakout rooms as well, but I want you to go ahead and think about them. Um, and in your group, I hope that you'll get to both of them, but if not, certainly one, everyone should be able to respond to one. The first one is, when was the first time you realized that race mattered? Describe the moment or the interaction. When was the first time you realized that race mattered? Describe the moment or the interaction. And then the second one is, share a reflection about a moment when you observe someone being discriminated against because of race. What did you do? How did it make you feel? How have you used that moment to inform your cross-racial engagements? Again, share a reflection about a moment when you observe someone being discriminated against because of race. What did you do? How did it make you feel? How have you used that moment to inform your cross-racial engagements? And the first one, when was the first time you realized that race mattered? Describe the moment or the interaction. And so we're going to, um, Brittany and I are going to try, I'm going to try to place you in um, breakout rooms and um, we're gonna do our very best to make them even. And um, you, as soon as you get into the room and you have the group, we're hoping that maybe there are no more than about six of you in each room you all can begin discussing and, and take notes, okay? All righty, so let me get to the, let's see, uh-oh, sorry about that. So Brittany, for some reason, my, um, let me see, okay. Okay, we're gonna do our breakout rooms now. And you will receive a, note, a notice and you just go to your room, okay? Oh, no. Hello. Let's see. All right. Uh, I think it's three of us. I'm not sure. Frank. Oh, we've got Jesse in here. Perfect. Hey, it's good. Hey, y'all. Uh. I know these people. Yeah. <laughs> And Frank, if you can hear us, you're welcome to join us. I know some people are at their offices at the moment, too. So <laughs> I'm actually in the process of moving today, so I'm at home. So today was not the greatest day, but, you know. <laughs> Understood. Well, feel free to stay on mute or, or to chime in on the conversation if you can. But perhaps, Jesse, do you want to start us off? Sure. So I wrote down, I wrote, you wrote the questions down, too, right? So I, think it's I did. I wrote them all down in the chat group. So, oh, good. And I, I think a picture too that way I can look at it because I think I still haven't figured out 
how to manage a chat versus the, uh, the, <laughs> the breakout rooms. But the first question was, when was the first time you realized that race matter? Who wants to share? I'm happy to. Uh, my first memory was really more in college, quite honestly. And um, it was a bit of what Brittany and I were talking about earlier. I grew up in Southern California and I grew up in a, a diverse community, I would say. But it wasn't until I moved to Texas where I just saw people treated differently, both, both good and bad and a couple experiences. So I think that that was my, my first experience was moving to a different part of the country and, and just seeing, seeing people treated differently. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah. For, yeah my, me, I'm sorry, Brittany. Go ahead. No, go ahead. You go right ahead. You go right ahead. So I, I would say for me, it was probably college as well. I, I, can't give a specific moment, but I would say the reason I think it was college, I think if I look back on things, I would have known it earlier because I grew up in rural South Georgia, but I don't think I was, I think in, I so I was able to realize it in college because it was probably at a point where I was mature enough in my life to see the difference and to have left rural South Georgia, and not that Athens, Georgia isn't still in the deep South, but mm -hmm. you know, Athens is much different than where I grew up in rural South Georgia. And you know, one of my best friends in college was from New Jersey. And I remember taking him home to visit my parents and my parents, um, you know, calling me a Yankee because I had gone off to mm -hmm. Athens. And so I think it was just, being in a different space and being around people who weren't all from that the community where I grew up in rural South Georgia that it was a point at which I was mature enough to realize and to start to see the differences it was not necessarily the first time that I had actually seen them sure mm. makes sense watch you Brittany um, for me, I would also say it was in college. Um, and Casey and I both went to Baylor. So, uh, it's, you know, Baylor is an awesome school. And I would say compared to some other Texas colleges, it's pretty diverse. I know that they try really hard. It's actually one of their, their missions, um, in having a diverse campus. And, um, I think, I think the first time that it, it was like a real, situation for me was um, my my boyfriend in college was black and we had gotten pulled over and I was driving and he got taken out of our car and it was wow. it was so traumatic but it wasn't traumatic for him at all he just kept telling me he was like this is okay it's okay I was like what part of this is okay mm -hmm. and um you know, and my dad's an attorney. So in natural fashion, I had him write a letter to everyone. Um, but it, it was just one of those times that, you know, there's things that you hear, but you, you might not ever experience. And I had heard of situations like that before. Of course, you've seen situations like that in movies. Um, and living that, I just, Oh my goodness. It it was, um, it, it was eye opening. So, it, and then, you know, there was more, more things that happened after that. And I think it was because my eyes were a little closed before. So I, I wouldn't, there could have been something small before that moment that happened and I never saw it. But after that moment, there, there were locks. Sure. I'm glad you shared that. Thank you for sharing that, that, that part. I would say, well, I think I won't be surprised that that response isn't consistent because I think uh, college is probably the most the first time when we really break away from our families and becoming more independent. And as a result, our consciousness is being raised and we're challenging things. Because I would say, for me too, I mean, some defining moments. Uh, you, we know the healing prize, like we define more. I, I think college, my initial response though was college, but then I remember at some reflection points in my life. It was evident at 16 and even before 16 um, 
And I think it's because in, we understand learning, we get things handed down to our parents, our trusted connections and networks and shared perspectives. And we don't realize we're hearing it, but we're hearing it and we're seeing it. And so short story, I saw the two kids in uh, middle school last week. I think I told this to Brittany last week. And I was talking about visible diversity. And I was asking the question, hey, use me. What things you want to, to see? And they mentioned, oh, you're male, you're older. I'm glad I said older, not old. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and they even mentioned the fact that they know I was in Philadelphia, and that's different because I, I, I acknowledged I was in Philadelphia and I live in Seattle. But no one, none of the kids would say I was black hmm. or African American. It was quiet. So I said, so I said, what's the one visible, obvious distinction I have that's diverse? No one would say it. And then finally, one little white girl said, Ooh. African American. And I said, yes. And the teacher said, that, thank you for saying I know that was hard for you. And I'm thinking in my head, why is that hard for us? So when I get to that statement, I think we, we, we see differences early in life. We just don't, we don't, can't really process why. And it happens from what we see in TV, from what our families may reinforce or enforce or whatever it may be our, our networks around us. But we see it way sooner in our earlier development than we acknowledge. So I'm glad and you, you see in these conversations, what's opening up for us is that younger version of us when that first event happened. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and we dive into that and say, oh, why has this been an area of non-discussion? Right, and so now I'm glad we're having a discussion. So, so thank you for sharing. Um, cool. What's the other question? Well, cool, but not cool. But <laughs> the other one was <laughs> as you bring that up, I had this moment just last yeah. week. Yeah, you know, trying to educate myself and, and understand because it is difficult just as a yeah. white woman to say, yeah. you know, what what is politically correct? Do I always use the term African American? Do I always use the term black? And, and I think that that's a really helpful conversation also, but yeah. serendipitously, I walked into my daughter's room and she was playing with this cabbage patch that was mine as a child. And it's a black cabbage patch yeah. that I had when I was five. And it was important for my parents, like the dolls I played with, you know, like this little, this little sweet cabbage patch. And I well, asked my daughter the same thing. I said, so is this, is this cabbage patch any different than your other dolls? And she's like, no, they're all fun. They're having tea. Like, like she didn't even see it yeah. like, yeah. to your point. Like she didn't know how to articulate like, yes, this little doll is, is black and the rest yeah. of them, you know, yeah. so I, I thought that that was, was interesting. Like just as a parent trying to figure out like how we talk to our kids and, and those kinds of things too. I love it, Casey, because my, my, the possibility that I would love to create in the world, I think we're moving in that direction, is that we finally get this racism stuff down to nothing. It really is nothing. If we literally cut us ourselves open, my organs are exact same as your organ. And we know, you go to like, people do, do donate their, their, their organs, guess what? You can go to anybody's body, right? And so we- We all bleed red. Right, we, yeah. So we learn this, uh, the, we learn these, these challenges through what's been told to us. And it's been lies. Yeah. And, and we understand the, the financial part that ties to it and why it happens. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the second part to that question, too, of if you witnessed something, um, I yeah. think for me, and, and I am glaringly aware of my privilege that I haven't witnessed it personally, right? But I, I think, as I think through my childhood, it was jokes. It was really just, you know, my uncle telling that really inappropriate mm -hmm. joke at Thanksgiving. And, yeah. uh, and, and I grew up in the LA and, and there's the distinction on like the Asian community and there's always a punchline, right? Like just for fairness, it, it, there's always some kind of punchline. So yeah. I, I think for me, where I practice like finding my voice if I think back as a teenager is telling my uncle that I don't think those are funny. Right? Correct. Like, I, it's, like I'm not going to absently laugh at your joke. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm one for a good joke. I love a family meal with some jokes, fantastic, but not at the expense of, of someone else. So that was just what kind of came to mind. That's, um, that's a really good one. I appreciate that. Cause that, that ties to what I love now, the discussion around being 
hey, how do I be anti-racist? You know, people, and I, I like that term. That's, that that was new for me too. I mean, I've been in this space for a long time. Like, oh, good point because it's, it's, I'm using a, a very horrific but relevant. And I want you guys to, to share it as well. We as humans, we are quick to point at other folks when we see fault. It's just our nature. I can see, oh, Brittany did this here, but I can't see what Jesse did something, right? And we all do as human. So when George Floyd happened and everyone witnessed how the, all, the other police officers was watching, not doing anything, why this guy eight minutes and 46 seconds was being murdered. We do that. You just mentioned, Casey, we do that in our everyday life. We witness and watch things happen and we take no action, which is you're accomplice to the situation when you take no action. And I love the fact that we are acknowledging that part, including myself, making sure, hey, when something's not appropriate, say something, right? If I see the laws that something's not written right, do something, mm-hmm. right? And, and as opposed to making an assumption that someone's going to do it. And I always say, if you see it, that means you are that person that was meant to do it. And we, we always think, oh, someone will take care of it. No, no, it's in your head. Your conscience is telling you, you are that person to do it. And that way we get away from the uh, deflecting and hold ourselves accountable. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Beautiful, beautiful. I can't remember, Jesse, if it was on one of our, um, our, one of our concert series, or it might have happened really close to, you know, like the same evening. but. I was having a conversation with someone um, about, you know, change and how, um, you know, we obviously we're different than our parents and our parents are different than our grandparents. But if you grew up in a, in a family where, like Casey said, there were those jokes and it felt wrong in Casey's world that that, that that was happening, but no one else spoke up and said anything. And so when, when you're in a family like that, which I, I am, um, it's, if you don't speak up, there's no change that happens. Bingo. Someone has to speak up. And uh, I, I can't remember who I was talking to, but uh, right, it was yeah. just about how, you know, what I think, I feel like it was you, but yeah. it was yeah. just about how, you know, if we want our kids to be different, it's not just being different ourselves. It's, speaking up in those moments yes. and showing that they're not okay. Correct. And, and as harmless as they seem, they are still very harmful yeah. because it, it puts ideas in your head that, that that's okay. Yeah. And it's not. Yeah. It's, it's almost, I was, I was almost by design because we teach our kids that like they have to not say something their voice that they think that the voice don't matter. So we start to trap our voice. By not saying mm-hmm. something to the adults, we are that same version of our, our childhood. And I think when we get into college, mm-hmm. we start to feel we had our own voice. And that's a shift for us. But we still have to unpack mm-hmm. so much from our early childhood of not having a voice and those moments being passed that we do it in our office. We do it in the hallways. We do it in our family conversations. And that's the paradigm shift that we need to literally lean into. Yeah. Oh, yeah. For sure. We have a visitor. <laughs> hey. We do have a visitor. Love it. I just, I've, you're the last, I've just been visiting each one just to listen in, not comment. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Good dialogue. Good dialogue. Oh, carry on. Carry on. That, I'll give you all a few more minutes. I'll, I'll send out a little notice and give you just a few more minutes to wrap up, but carry on. I love it. <laughs> and Dr. Spence, I was actually going to ask you what your timing was, because it looks like we're about 10 minutes to the yeah, hour. Yeah, I'm so. getting ready to send a message to yeah, bring folks that, back. That's perfect. Uh-huh. Yeah, in. you're the last. I just wanted to... It's been a, a great conversation. I think the three of us ended up in here together. <laughs> yeah. We're like, oh, man, it's a powerhouse group right here. <laughs> yeah, we stacked that. <laughs> we're going to time to that for next time. <laughs> We, we have the trust already built there, right? We're going to layer in. Yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> right in. <laughs> so the other one, too, right? They like share yeah. reflection about a moment, right? So that's what I'm talking about right now. Yeah, you, so you mentioned earlier, um, yep. or you were talking about a joke. I grew up yeah. in rural South Georgia. And when I was growing up, you know, the N word was still commonly and customarily used Mm -hmm. frequently. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I was growing up, I didn't know any better. I used the word because that's what I was taught. That's what you did. I mean, Mm -hmm. you know, and we even, 
and I didn't know this until I was an adult, Brazilian nuts. When I was growing up, they were, the N word was used to describe a Brazilian nut. Yeah. And I, literally as an adult, I think I was in my thirties, maybe my late twenties when I used the, called the Brazilian nut and somebody's like, do you not really know what that is? I'm like, no, cause this is all I've ever heard it called. And yeah, so it man. is so amazing how our backgrounds and where we I grew up you, really man. do. All right, welcome back. How's everybody? It's <laughs> good. How was that? So could we get maybe just two people to share something that you, that was said that you found um, either one of those aha moments or wow, hadn't thought about that moment um, for from either of the um either of the prompts just two people if we can from well let me just from the prompt one when was the first time you realized that race mattered describe the moment of interaction and we get a volunteer or volunteers to share and if you can use the reaction button it's down in the bottom of the screen oh we've got amy johnson she's happy to share but if you okay. use the reaction button i can i can unmute you give me just a second amy i've got you Okay, Amy, you can unmute yourself. Hi, everybody. Can you all hear me? Can I get a thumbs yeah. up from somebody? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. Um, so my example, I think, when it dawned on me, um, almost made me grin, but I love music. Music is my background. I grew up in the South. And what I um, shared was, for me, and I, I didn't think about how big of an issue it was, I think I always thought that racism was a Southern issue, um, mm -hmm. was hearing the song Ebony and Ivory mm -hmm. for the first time, right? And and thinking about the true meaning behind it and, and kind of understanding that it was such a, a bigger picture than just what even I'd been exposed to in the South. Um, and then something that came up in our group conversation, and we had a really, really open group, really willing to share, but something that came up was, um, less about what I had, what we had experienced and that, that influenced us for the first time, I think, but just the fact that some of us probably didn't even realize we were seeing it when it was happening sometimes because of our own perceptions and our own perspective on things that you don't, you're not even always aware of it, um, let alone the impact it's having on someone else. So it was kind of eye opening just to hear from everyone their own perspectives on, on what they had been exposed to growing up and, and how just this short 10 minute conversation made us look at things a little differently. Very good. Thank you so much for sh sharing, Amy. Thank you. Was well, there a volunteer for the second one? Share a reflection about a moment when you observed someone being discriminated against and how did that make you feel? Is there a volunteer for that one? And if you can just type in the chat group or do the reaction hand raise. Let us I know. Can you. Or you can just raise your hand. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Anyone? Oh, Christopher. Oh, Christopher. Okay. Here okay. we go. Let's get Christopher. And Christopher, you can unmute yourself. Hello. Thank you. Um, I actually shared, and my first response was, I guess, really for both of them, and that is, in elementary school, I, I'm from Oklahoma, so in elementary school, I had classmates that did not like the Native Americans, and uh, to shorten this, one Native American friend of mine was a fairly aggressive girl, and she had long nails, and she caused some scratches and deep deep um, cuts on my arm, and the other students tried to use that as an excuse for why you shouldn't be friends with the Native Americans. And I took that as the exact opposite. Peer pressure usually has the opposite effect on me that it does most people. If you try to pressure me into something, I'm gonna do the exact opposite of it. And that was more of an opportunity for me to see that I needed to communicate more and understand more on the other side because if people don't like something, then we need to go forward from there. Okay. 
Thank you, Christopher. Thank you. And, you know, I was able to visit um, each of the rooms and just kind of eavesdrop for a few moments. And it sounds like you all had some very deep discussions. And so that's so important. And again, you all can share um, even after this event, or you might want to pose that question to others in your community and just see what, you know, what some of the responses are. Let me just share my um, very last slides with you. And um, as we, again, we're trying to be very mindful of your time. So we will, here we go. Okay. So we are, let's see. Okay. This is where we are. You know, um, Martin Luther King Jr.'s last book was called, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community? And it was in that text that he talked about building a beloved community, a beloved community. But we know that education is very important for all of us. And so why is education important? You know, because we're, we're confused, you know, as we think about this moment. Some of us feel lost, some are perplexed, like what is going on? We're disoriented, we're bewildered. Um, there's a sociologist, um, Emil Durkheim, who talks about anomie, which is a state of normlessness. It's like, you know, what's right, what's wrong? We've got COVID-19, we've got racial unrest, we've got um, the unlawful use of deadly force or debating that. And so there's a lot going on. But in this moment, we can capture it so that we can actually move from perhaps a feeling of chaos and disorientation and, and lack of certainty to a moment of building community. And so one of the texts that I'm going to engage next time is, and this is just one because I like to have authors in conversation with each other, but this is one that is very hot on the New York Times um, bestseller list. Um, this young man, Ibram Kendi, his book is How to Be an Anti-Racist. And it is very instructive for individuals of all races in terms of the ways in which we all might participate in racist actions or actions that are informed by racist ideologies. And so he is trying to give us instruction. What's really nice about the text is also, it's a narrative. It's really, it's kind of biographical, but at the same time, it's historical and very scholarly. And so I'm going to engage this text along with some other texts next, um, next time we meet so that we can dig even deeper into what I hope were really um, wonderful conversations for you. And um, I really want to thank you for your attentiveness, for your honesty and your candor in your sessions, because I believe that you were sharing stories that perhaps you haven't told in a while or certainly have not told in this kind of mixed community. But we will come together, I hope, I hope I'll see you all again as we kind of move through this three-part series and, um, and together we can become more a part of the solution than the problem because we all have a stake in this. And so I just want to again thank Casey and Brittany and Anna for bringing us together and um, giving us this, you know, this little moment in time as we you know, move forward as a community and members of the community, club core community, because the club core community wants everybody to feel like they're at home. And, and that's what we want to do. We want to create that space so we all feel like we're at home. So and let, uh, if Thank there you, are not Jessica. any other questions or if Casey and Brittany, if you have something else you need to say at this moment, just a, a heartfelt thank you, both, both to you for your guidance. Um, I'll speak on, on my behalf, but I think the whole group I see here, uh, really grateful to be your, your student today mm -hmm. and right. to engage in the conversation. And um, for, for next steps, I do just want to say, mm -hmm. if you can find her in your gallery, Stephanie and the Columbia Tower Club have had an amazing series on Friday evenings okay. um, with songs of hope and healing. And tomorrow night is the, the love focus. Mm -hmm. And Stephanie, correct us if we're, I'm wrong, um, but our classical art songs and arias. So Stephanie, I just appreciate you sharing your voice with us on our community. Mm -hmm. For all of our members, yeah. if you get your Tuesday emails where you may have found the link to this event, um, there is a link to register for tomorrow night's time of music as well. Um, so just wanted to, to make that mention. 
and then I can drop it in the chat. Yeah, if you don't mind, Brittany, that, that's helpful. If, if there's some, um, I have personally been able to participate and, and really just felt such joy from Stephanie's voice. So thank you, Stephanie. Um, and then please, please, if you haven't already, um, make the time for, for the next conversation. So we're meeting every two weeks on Thursday. And Dr. Spence, appreciate the, um, the next steps. Yeah. If it's okay with this group, we do have your email addresses. Um, so if you do not want to receive an email from us, please, you can uh, message me privately, but we will send out just some next step notes um, for, for the name of the book and, and a couple of the slides that were shared today. Um, this will also be posted as a recording. Yeah. So if there's someone in your life that you feel like would benefit from this talk, um, they'll be able to just play the recording at their convenience. Um, so just wanted to make sure to, to share that. But I too um, hope to see all of the faces here today and some additions um, in two weeks time. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you, Dr. Spence. Thank you, thank everyone. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Oh, bye-bye. Marshall, it looks like you have a question. If you wanna throw it in the, the chat or we can figure out how to unmute you. <laughs> If you have time to stay on, everyone, um, we can open up the, the lines okay. a little bit. Sure. Um, but if you're at work and need to get on to your next task, please feel free to, to drop off. Let, let me just ask you this. Is there some one of you, first of all, I tuned in late. I'm sorry uh, I was late. But I wonder if there's somebody I could talk to offline, not, not now, about some questions I have because I, 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 I'd like to do some awakening uh, in uh, a, a group that I belong to uh, locally. Matter of fact, I'm the, the, pr the president right now. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to do some awakening, but, but I have questions. Okay. And uh, so I wonder if you can give me a name, a phone number, uh, somebody I maybe talk to tomorrow or something and spend a few sure. minutes on, online. Casey, I don't mind if you want to share my inf my contact information. Okay. If that if you think that would be helpful, Marshall. Yes. Yes, that, okay. that would be very good. Okay, Marshall. Appreciate. What I'll do is I'll I'll send you an email and just make an introduction to Dr. Spence. Mm -hmm. But I also do want to bring up whenever you're comfortable. I've heard from a number of members on what does this look like at my club, right? What what does this conversation look like? you know, as it relates to a committee or, or something. So we, we will, um, Dr. Spence and I chatted about that uh, as well. Um, so we might have some next steps over the course of the next two conversations. Mm -hmm. on what's next? It's yeah. kind of in line with Dr. King's last book, yes, right? Like, yes. Is it chaos or community? How do we continue to build community? Um, so I'll make that introduction most, most definitely, Marshall, but I do think there will be more, Dr. Spence, on just for sure. all of us. How, how do we continue to facilitate yeah. Sure. sure. Yeah, I Great. think this is so important. And so I, I'm in. So <laughs> Great. appreciate that. Any other questions from the, the smaller group before we sign off today? Okay. okay, great. Well, thank you so Bye. much for your time, everyone. We'll see you in a couple weeks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye.